How's everybody doing tonight? I am so glad to have you guys join us tonight. This is our Wisdom Wednesday experience. And you guys would not believe what just happened 10 minutes uh, before the timer hit for us to go live. Our main computer shut down and everything that we had uploaded in the computer in terms of the slides that I was going to have on screen for you guys to see. Uh, all of that stuff is gone. And I'm just over here like, man, I cannot believe that that happened. But we're going to persevere. Uh, you're going to be blessed nonetheless. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, if you will, to go ahead and share uh, because tonight's lesson is going to be a blessing. I promise you that it's going to be an absolute blessing. If you guys will take a few minutes to share, I'm going to grab another thumb drive and see if I can do a quick upload That'll give me enough time to maybe try to reset some of the slides that I had and uh, get you guys to share. So give me a few minutes, uh, not the full five, maybe we'll say a couple of minutes if you guys can do that. And then we'll be back and we'll see if we can uh, get this thing going the way that we wanted it to go. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right, guys, I want to thank you all for being patient tonight. As I've said before, we are having some technical difficulties, but we are trying to work our way through them. I know that this lesson is going to be a blessing. I know that anytime you start punching the devil in the face, man, he just cannot take it. And he does all kind of crazy things to try to interrupt uh, what God had planned for tonight. And I, I'm just really like, man, I cannot believe that that actually happened about 10 minutes out my main computer crashed and it's still trying to come up. So I had to switch to another computer that I was not prepared to, to use. And I haven't had the time to load all my stuff on it, but nonetheless, we're going to persevere because I know God's got a word for us tonight. I want to pray really quickly since I see that the enemy is doing his best to bother us. Why don't we jump into some prayer really quick? Father, we just want to say thank you for this opportunity to share your word. We declare that we are, your sons and your daughters. We are children of the most high God, the God who is our father, the God who adopted us, the God who loves us. And we want you to know how much we care about you. We're going to persevere tonight in the midst of technical difficulties uh, because we know that you have a word for your people tonight. And we just give you praise in the name of your son, Jesus, Yeshua. We say amen, amen, and amen. Are you guys ready for a word tonight? I'm, I'm ready to deliver this word no matter what the enemy is doing. Uh, we're going to persevere. Tonight's lesson is entitled, Are You Right on the Money? Are you right on the money? That's the lesson. Are you right on the money? I hope that your answer is yes, I'm right on the money. Now, when we talk about being right on the money, we're talking about money tonight. That is the subject that God placed in my heart to share and to minister. And this is going to be something that's really powerful. It's probably not what you think. And I think when I'm done, you're going to be like, thank you, Pastor Troy, for taking the time to bless us with that word, because it's a game changing word. I want to share a fact with you that many of you probably know, uh, but it really sets the tone for part of our lesson tonight. Did you know that 80 percent of lottery winners actually lose it all within five years? 80 percent of all lottery winners lose every dime that they have won within five years. Most people, and this is a fact, most people are not even remotely prepared to deal with what is called 
sudden wealth syndrome. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but there's a syndrome called sudden wealth where a person comes into an amount of money, a large amount of money. Suddenly it happens to lottery winners. It happens to professional athletes. And oftentimes if they have not been prepared with money management skills, if they haven't been prepared uh, with the basic construct of understanding how money operates in five years, those individuals are usually broke. I think for the NBA, I think I read somewhere that it's like two or three years after the average NBA player is done playing that they are absolutely broke. I want to ask you a question. How prepared are you for sudden wealth syndrome? How prepared are you for sudden wealth syndrome? Because what most believers don't understand is that the prayers that they're praying, asking God to bless them, asking God to do some amazing things in their lives, that those prayers are the kind of prayers that if God would answer most of our prayers, would put us in a sudden wealth situation where if God answered all of our prayers and you think about all the things you've been praying for and all the things you're asking God for. And what if God suddenly manifested everything you've been asking him for? You would find yourself in a sudden wealth situation. The question is, though, are you really prepared for it? And I know, I know the average person is going to tell me, Pastor Troy, you just don't know. I'm ready. I've been ready. I stay ready. And all of that sounds really good. I want to say something to you, though. You are not ready for sudden wealth, not until you understand and can control the root cause of poverty. Now you say, what do you mean the root cause of poverty? Well, the root cause of poverty is something I call PNG. I didn't say PPNG. I said PNG. What is PNG, Pastor? PNG stands for pride and greed. Pride and greed are the root cause of poverty. And if you don't understand how to control PNG, how to master PNG, how to understand PNG and how it works, then whatever God gives you, it will ultimately become your demise. You've been blessed before. You've had abundance before. Many of you have had surpluses. You've had good months and good years and where things were just flowing your way. And many people watching this live will have to testify that, yes, I, I've, I've had some great harvest in my life. I've, I've been blessed abundantly at times in my life. But if you look around, you don't have much to show for it. If you look around, that was something that happened in the past. And now you're in a position where you're asking God to bless you again and increase you again. And I am discovering more and more as I watch the body of Christ, as I pastor the body of Christ, that many, many believers have an issue with pride and greed, and most of them don't even realize it. See, pride and greed is sneaky. Pride and greed is so sneaky that you can have it and not realize you have it. But tonight, I may be able to help you see it. Here's a fundamental question I want you to think about. What if God's love and God's mercy is shielding you from financial abundance? Oh my God. Let me let me pause. Let me pause. Let me pause. Because I know somebody, somebody probably didn't understand that. Let me say that again. What if God's love and mercy is shielding you from financial abundance? Well, I mean, what if that's the case? You say, I, I never thought about that, Pastor. Well, I want you to think about it tonight because God has an obligation to make sure that whatever he blesses you with, it doesn't wind up becoming a curse in your life. God has an obligation to look out for you, even though what you're praying for, you strongly desire. But if what you are praying for, you're not prepared for, somebody needs to hear this. God has a higher obligation not to put more on you than you can bear. Mm, I ask the question again, what if God's love and God's mercy is shielding you from financial abundance? See, I know a lot of people in church and maybe some of you are watching tonight and you'll probably thank me for this lesson before this is done. A lot of people in church, they give tithes and they give offerings. They sow seeds and they do so faithfully. But there's a problem and I think many people don't realize it. Tithing, giving, and sowing done for the sole purpose of reaping can become an issue of pride and greed. 
Oh my God. Somebody's going to thank me for this lesson tonight. Let me say it again. Tithing, giving, and sowing done for the sole purpose of reaping can become an issue of pride and greed. Here's what I want to tell you. And I know you've probably never heard this before. And if you've heard it before, I promise you, I know you haven't heard it many times before. Don't tithe, don't give, and don't sow to reap. Wait a minute. What did he just say? Yeah, you heard me. I, I want to help you. Don't tithe, don't give, and don't sow to reap. Why? Why would you tell me not to tithe, not to give, and not to sow to reap? Because when you tithe, give, and sow for the sole purpose of reaping, pride and greed have a sneaky little way of creeping up into your heart and really preventing you from receiving the harvest that you deserve, receiving the harvest that God desires to give to you. But pride and greed are like canker worms. They're like the caterpillar. They devour and they eat. Why? Because pride and greed are our enemies. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about pride and greed. Okay, I, I hear you out there. Well, Pastor, if 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 you if you're telling me not to tithe and, and give and sow to reap, what am I supposed to tithe and give and so forth? And, and I'm so glad you asked because I'm definitely not telling you not to tithe, not telling you not to sow, not telling you not to give. No, because we we need to do those things. That's a part of how we express our love and our gratitude to God. Here's why you need to tithe, give, and sow to recalibrate your heart and to re-examine your motives. Woo, this is going to be a deep lesson tonight. Yeah, every time you tithe, every time you give, every time you sow, the sole purpose of your giving and your tithing and your sowing should be, one, to recalibrate your heart, two, to re-examine your motives. Whoa, Pastor Troy, what are you talking about? See, Giving is not just about the money. If that was the case, everybody that gives would be blessed. Everybody that souls would have amazing harvest. Everybody that tithe would be wealthy if it was just about the money. So you got to ask yourself, how are people tithing and giving and sowing and still in poverty, still struggling financially, still waiting on a breakthrough, waiting on a harvest? There has got to be something that we're missing and I'm here tonight only by the grace of God to give you the something that we're missing. And God gave me this to give you because he wants to give you what he has for you. But he can't until you fix and repair this issue that we're going to expose tonight. Again, I say giving is not just about the money. It's just as much about the motive. Oh, this is good teaching tonight. See, we focus on the money, but... There are two sides of this coin. The other side of the money is the motive. Why are you giving? Why are you giving and what are you expecting to receive? Are you giving for the sole purpose of getting something or are you giving because you love God? Why are you giving? That's a, that's, that's a fundamental question that I want you to ask every time you give. Why am I giving? Do you know that some people give to be seen? Yeah. Do you know that some people give because they don't want to hear the pastor's mouth? It's a fact. They, they, don't, they don't want anybody calling them into a meeting. So they give to stay out of trouble. They give, you know, because everybody else gives. And all of these things are really cancerous caterpillars and canker worms that devour the harvest before you ever see it. I want to go to 1 Peter 5 and 6. And listen, while I'm talking, guys, I'm actually multitasking behind the scenes. I'm uploading stuff. So I'm hoping I'm uploading the right slide. We're about to find out. 1 Peter 5 and 6. Nope, that's not the right one. <laughs> 1 Peter 5 and 6. If you got your Bible, do me a favor. Go to 1 Peter 5 and 6. Man, this is a, this is a challenging night tonight. I declare, but we are not going to be defeated. You hear me? We are not going to be de defeated. First Peter five and six, first Peter five and six, go to your Bible and, and see if you can see what I see. 
That's not it either. I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying to find these scriptures. See, when my computer crashed, oh, the devil, I tell you, I hate the devil. Here's what 1 Peter 5 and 6 says. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand. There it is that he may lift you up in due time. We are not going to be defeated. Satan, you might as well quit because we're not going to stop. The Bible says that as believers, it is our responsibility to do what? Humble ourselves. Now, if you don't humble yourself, what's the opposite of being humble? Being proud. So when I say when you give, recalibrate and reexamine, it's an opportunity for you to reset your spirit, your soul, your mind, your attitude, and to say, you know what? Okay, it's offering time. The first thing I need to do before I give, I want to humble myself. And there's a place where you need to humble yourself. The Bible says, under God's mighty hand. Now, this is important because what God is trying to show us is that we need to clearly understand that if we're going to humble ourselves, we have to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand which says to God, we recognize that you are greater than we are. We recognize that this is about you and not about me. No matter how much I'm giving, no matter how much I give, I'm going to humble myself. Imagine this is the hand of God. This is you. Humble myself under the mighty hand of God. Now, listen, there's a reason why God tells us to do this. And this is the blessing that you're going to get tonight. The reason why God tells us to hum humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God is because God has a plan. God is planning to do something. God's planning to do something for you and in you and through you if you would just humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. What is God planning to do? That he may lift you up. Oh, my God. See, what the enemy does, he tricks us into lifting ourselves up. And somebody needs to catch this with one hand. You will never be able to lift yourself as high as God can and will. So you might want to humble yourself because whatever height you lift yourself, it fails in comparison to what God was able to do and what God had in his mind to do. And a lot of us have made the mistake of lifting ourselves up. And then on top of lifting ourselves up, we have the audacity to ask God to take us higher. <laughs> Somebody's going to get this. Yeah, we lift ourselves up and then we ask God to help us. We ask God to give us a breakthrough. And God says, no, 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 no. It seems like you're in the lifting business. So while you're over there lifting yourself up, I'm going to let you go ahead and go as high as you can go. Because had you humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God, God would have lifted you up. Catch this in due time. Do you see that in first Peter five and six in due time? God says he's going to lift you up. This is why you got to understand God's got plans for us. God's got some amazing plans and all of the plans of God are designed to bless us, uplift us, position us, help us, enable us. Why? Because he wants us to be a reflection of him, but we can't be a reflection of him if we're too busy getting puffed up in ourselves. And listen, let me break this down really quick. You can have issues with pride and greed and not have a lot of money. So please don't think that this is just a message for people that are sitting on a bunch of money, people who we call wealthy and prosperous. No, there are a lot of people in poverty that are full of pride and full of greed. There are a lot of people in poverty who fail to humble themselves and they act like they're doing God a favor. We act like we're doing God a favor when we come to church. We act like it's such an inconvenience to go to church for two hours when we go to a job that we hate for eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. It's amazing how we treat God as we look at how we treat everything else in our lives. And we wonder why the struggle is real sometimes. I want to teach you tonight about money and how, how God wants us to view money and how God wants us to understand that money cannot be an issue in our lives, especially if we keep asking God to give us more because God is searching our hearts. Can I get an amen somewhere that says God is searching our heart? 
Now, here's what I need you to understand. God uses money more than anything else to do three specific things. I want to teach tonight. Yeah, devil, you thought you was going to stop this lesson, but you're not going to stop this lesson. We're going to press all the way through, man. God does what? Take notes. If you're taking notes, God uses money more than anything else to do three specific things in the life of the believer. Here's number one. God uses money to strengthen your faith. Mm, that's good, man. God uses money to do what, Pastor Troy? God uses money to strengthen your faith. Pastor, where you get that from? I actually get that from Hebrews 11 and 6. Hebrews 11 and 6 says this, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who approaches him must believe that he exists and must believe that he rewards those who earnestly seek him Hebrews 11 and 6. Now, this is a powerful verse that we kick around a lot, but I don't think we fully understand what it really means. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. I'm teaching you tonight that God uses money, number one, to strengthen our faith. It takes faith to trust God with the resources that we have, especially if the resources are tight, if the resources are few, if we're going through a pandemic, if things are difficult. If the financial future of your family or your household, or your income is uncertain, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to take faith to keep giving to God. You would be surprised, though, how many people over the last year have stopped putting their faith in God. Oh, no, Pastor, I still believe in God. I still trust in God. What's your giving look like? Oh, no, Pastor, I, I still believe in God. God is my source, and I've got faith. My faith is in God. How has your giving changed during the pandemic? Hmm, it's quiet in here now. See, what I'm trying to teach you is that you've got to understand that we are in a spiritual war. And just because something seems logical and feasible, oftentimes there are ramifications that will flow from the spirit world into the natural world that you and i will have to reap the consequences because we abandoned our faith that brought us this far oh my god this is a good lesson god uses money to strengthen our faith and without faith it's impossible to please god because anyone that approaches him must believe that he exists and must believe that he does what you must believe that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. See, it's proof that we really don't believe that God really rewards those who earnestly seek him. Because if we really believe that, we will be seeking God, not just on Sunday. Preach Pastor Troy Wynn Sr. Man, we'd be seeking God on Sunday afternoon. We'd be seeking God on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We'd be seeking God on Friday night. We'd be seeking God on Saturday. And I'm not talking about going to church seven days a week. I'm talking about having a heart towards God. I'm talking about having a connection with God, your heavenly father. Why? Because you fully believe that he rewards those who seek after him. It is obvious that many people do not believe that. Why? Because so many people have a casual approach to seeking God. It's easy to trust God when things are going well, brothers and sisters. It's easy. But how about when you lose your job? Mm. How about when you have lots of bills? How about when your car breaks down and you don't have the money to pay for the repair? Mm. What does that trust look like then? What does that faith look like then? Because that's really when faith is really faith. See, during those times, those difficult, challenging, hard times, those are the times, brothers and sisters, you got to hear me tonight, that God wants to see, not just here, mm, God wants to see, not just here, our trust in him. Oh, this is good. And here's the here's the truth of the matter. And this may be an ugly truth, but I, I got to tell it tonight because I came to help somebody. I really came to deliver and set free. The only time some of us will look up is when we are flat on our backs. Mm. I don't mean to offend anybody. I just want to tell the truth tonight. The only time some of us pray, the only time some of us think about God, the only time some of us even make our way to the house of God is when we are flat on our backs. Then it's, oh, I need the Lord. Oh, I need to go to church. 
Oh, 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 oh. And listen, listen, there's nothing wrong with that. You should come to God when you are flat on your back. You are smart to do so. But what does it say about you when you get up on your feet and you don't come to God? Oh, my God. What does it say about you when, when you get a lump sum of money and all of a sudden you forget about God? You forget about the work of God and it's all about you and what you want to do and the things that you've been waiting to do. See, let me tell you something. The heart tells us what we love. Mm, good God Almighty. And our actions will always be followed by where our heart leads us according to those things that we love. See, I'm trying to bless you tonight because I want you and God wants you to ask yourself a question. Are you right on the money or are you wrong with the money? That's the question tonight. <laughs> are you right on the money? I'm I want you to get right on the money because I don't want you to have this spiritual issue going on in the spirit realm and it be affecting your natural human existence on this planet. God uses money. Number two, number two. I pray to God y'all are being blessed. I pray to God y'all are being blessed. So I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you, your comments. Y'all going in. I see y'all. I see y'all. I got to stay focused though. I got to stay focused. Okay. Here's number two. Is anybody taking notes tonight? Is anybody taking notes? Because you should be. Number two, I told you God uses money to do three things. Number two, God uses money to test your motives. Mm, Pastor Troy, this is good. Say it again. God uses money to test your motives. Won't he do it? Yes, he will. How does God use money to test my motives? Well, Acts the fifth chapter, verses one through 11. And I, I believe this is the reason why my computer started acting crazy. I believe this is the reason because I don't think Satan wants y'all to see this scripture and I think it's this one story that he don't want y'all to, 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 to hear, but but we're going to make it do what it do tonight. Yeah, we're going to make it do what it do. Go to Acts, the fifth chapter, please. And we're going to read verses 1 through 11. Okay? 1 through 11. Let's check it out. Ah, look at that, devil. You can't stop us. We making this thing work tonight, guys. If y'all only knew what was going on behind the scenes, God is God is awesome. Okay, check this out. I'm going to read this story to y'all. Y'all follow me because this is dope and deep at the same time. I'm trying to show you how God uses money to test your motives. This is a story that you really want to pay attention to. It says, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property, real estate. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? I wish I had time to preach this. And you have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Okay, let me let me get this off the screen because I got to talk to y'all real quick. Let me let me bring you into what's happening. This is an epic story that every one of us needs to pay attention to. This husband and wife were in real estate. They sold a piece of property. Okay, they agreed together <laughs> to lie to the Holy Spirit. They, uh, I don't know if y'all understand this, money, and it wasn't money, let me be clear, it was their love of money that made them say, okay, be honest about how much we sold the land for, or let's lie to the Holy Spirit and let's keep some of this money because we got an issue with our love for money. We love money more than we love God. So, hey, we're going to tell this lie. And then after it's over, man, we're going to go shopping after it's over. We're going to go out to eat after we tell this lie to the Holy Spirit. We're going to go and live it up, man, because we we love this money. And I want y'all to follow this story because this story is scary and it's real. It goes on to say, Acts, the fifth chapter, 
verses 4, 5, and 6, the apostle says, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to a human being, but to God. Okay, I got to, I got to, I got to clear this off the screen and come back to it. Y'all need to hear me now. Y'all need to hear me because I'm trying to help you understand why things are going to happen the way they're going to happen in your life if you continue to be dishonest as it relates to money. The apostle says to this brother, you just didn't lie to me, the man of God. When we come into the house of God and we say that we're going to give God a certain portion of our increase and then we don't, you're not just lying to me. You're not just lying to God. And listen, we're not going to get on here and debate tithe and not tithe. I keep telling you guys all the time, tithe is nothing more than the opening of the field. I think that tithe is really the beginning of where we start giving and sowing to God. But some people don't tithe regularly. They don't give regularly and they will lie about it. You say, well, how they lie? They ain't saying nothing. Well, you're lying when you don't fully trust God and you say you are a believer. Let me help somebody tonight. You are lying when you earn a wage and you don't value God to be worthy enough to receive a certain portion of that wage, but you say you love God, you say God is the head of your life, you say that God is your source, something ain't adding up. And we allow money and the love of money to manipulate our minds. So when we do all of these, all of these crazy things, truly for the love of money. Let me go back to this story because this story is something serious, man. He says, you have not just lied to a human being, but you lied to God. Watch verse five now. When Ananias heard this, mm, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. I bet it did. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out to be buried. Okay, do I have anybody taking notes? Anybody taking notes? Because this story just said that it does not pay to lie to God. This story just said that it does not pay to allow money to make you make bad decisions because here's the connection. We're talking about money, we're talking about church, and we're talking about lying about amounts. We're talking about lying about what we're giving. This is in the Bible. I didn't make it up, guys. And the only reason why I teach it because I want you to see yourself wherever you may find yourself so that you can fix the problem so that God can begin to do what he wants to do in your life. Oh, it gets better. Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Verse seven, check this out. And about three hours later, mm -hmm, his wife came in. Lord have mercy. I'm trying to figure out why they didn't go to church together. This this is why y'all need to go to church together, husband and wives. If they had a went to church together, they they, they might have had a different experience. But the husband went first. Wife was probably running behind trying to get her hair done, get her nails done. So she shows up three hours later. Lord, she late. Lord, I Lord, I ain't gonna say. I ain't gonna say she must have been black. I ain't gonna say that. I'm just gonna say she was three hours late. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And she came in not knowing what had happened. See what see what happens when you late? Mm -hmm. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Now, she had an opportunity to tell the truth, y'all. Check out what she said. She said, yes. Oh, baby, why did you lie? She said, yes. That is the price. Girl, why you lie? And Peter said to her, don't miss this church. How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. Okay, stop the presses. Stop the presses. Is it worth it? That's what I'm trying to ask somebody tonight. Is it worth it? Huh? That little bit you keeping back from God. Is it worth it? 
Because here's what I found out, and I've been in church for a minute. As a matter of fact, I've been guilty. I've been guilty of holding back from God as a young believer, a young Christian. I've been guilty because, man, I felt like I needed that money more than God did. I felt like God didn't need my money. Shoot, I need this money. And I would not give what I was supposed to give. I've been there and I've done it as a young believer. And let me tell you something I know personally and I know it observationally. People who struggle with being generous as it relates to God and being generous as it relates to giving, these people never, ever get ahead and stay ahead. Notice I said get ahead and stay ahead because I've seen many get deceived because they had a windfall or they had a good season or they had a good month or they had a good year and things looked like everything was going well. And it was like, see, I told y'all, y'all ain't got to give God y'all money. God don't need y'all money. You ain't got to give God nothing. You ain't got to be worried or concerned about the work of the Lord. You ain't got to be worried or concerned about God's house. No, 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 no. Y'all don't, God ain't studying your money. And those people always find themselves in tremendous financial difficulty. Here's the crazy part. Part and somebody going, somebody going to get mad at me because they're going to think I'm talking about them, but I'm not. I'm just going to teach them what I know. Those are the very same people that wind up coming back to the church asking for financial help. Now, I got to choose my words carefully because I'm trying to build you. I'm not trying to break you. Those are the very same people that say, hey, can you help me out? And we say, yeah, yeah, we're glad to help you out. Uh, give us a minute, though. We want to check your financial records and, and check your giving uh, because we always want to make sure we take care of the household of faith. We always want to make sure we take care of those that have been faithful in their sowing and in their giving to the house of the Lord. We always want to make sure we take care of you. Just give us a minute so we can just check the books and, uh, and, and just verify your faithfulness. And oftentimes, 99.99999% of the time, when the books are checked, their faithfulness is nowhere to be seen. And I'm going to say this, and I hope y'all don't get mad, but I got to teach you that way you know what goes on and you know what to avoid. In our ministry, and I've talked with other pastors and they say they have the same issue. In our ministry, we have adults who work full-time jobs. Hair is always on point. Nails are always on point. Makeup is on point. Outfits are on point. They looking good. And when we look at their giving, we have people that have given $10 all year. Mm, yeah. And I'm not calling anybody's name. I'm just trying to show you how we deceive ourselves and we find money for everything else that we love. But when it comes time to give, we are psychologically able to dismiss ourselves from giving with all kinds of excuses that we think are legitimate. Here's the crazy part. Grown people working full-time jobs, giving $10 a year. You heard me. I didn't say $10 a month, $10 a year, some $20 a year. Here's the crazy part though. We have young people in our church, young people in our ministry who work part-time, who give more than adults who work full time. And I know what some of y'all say, well, you know, young people ain't got no bills and young people ain't got no responsibilities. And you may be right about that, but you mean to tell me you working a full time job and all year long, all you can give to God, to the ministry, to help the church continue to keep the lights on, keep the doors open, continue to feed you spiritually, continue to provide a place where you can worship when you decide you want to come to church. You mean to tell me that 10 and $20 is all you can do? or the best you can do for the year when you get your feet done on a regular basis. See, I look at the whole picture. Now, if you raggedy and struggling, then, I, I, then I'm not talking to you, but you get your feet done on a regular basis. You you go into the Atlanta Falcons football game, home games on Sunday. It's quiet in here now. I, I, let me leave this long because somebody's, somebody's getting disturbed. I'm just trying to show you how when we are not right with the money, we will have issues when it comes to worshiping God with our finances. We'll make the same mistake that these two people made, and we'll think it's okay to lie to God, or we'll think it's okay to hold back from God and not give to God. Do y'all want the rest of this story? I'm going to give it to you. Here it is. 
At that moment, she fell down at his feet and she died. What? Then the young men, here they come again, but these young men are busy. Do you hear me? Then the young men came in. What they come in and do? Young men came in, finding her dead, and they did what? Carried her out, and they did what? Buried her. Where they buried her at, Pastor? Right beside her husband. Watch verse 11. Great fear sees the whole church and all who heard about these events. Can I say something to you? What is it going to take for us to get shook up as it relates to our finances? What is it going to take for us to get shook up as it relates to M-O-N-E-Y and church? Because it seems like everybody's got a whole lot to say about not giving to the church, not supporting the church, not this and not that. And listen, I can't speak for nobody else's church. I can speak for the Freedom Church, and I've got proof and evidence and witnesses that will tell you that our finances are used properly that our finances are used to help people in need when we have those finances to help people in need, that our finances are used to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, get people out of jail, Freedom Church, Warner Robins, Georgia. This is what we are doing. So don't say all churches are, are, are evil and all pastors are pimps. Now, you, you can pass that on somewhere else. You can't bring that to the Freedom Church. Now, you can use that as an excuse if you're looking for a way out. But if you're looking for a place to use your finances to make a difference, then you will search for ministries like ours. And we're not the only one. There are others who do some of the same things. You'll search for those kind of ministries and say, you know what? God bless me. I'm blessed to be a blessing. And I don't have any problem giving back to God. What is it going to take, though? That's my question. What is it going to take for us to get shook up? I thank God I got shook up a long time ago. I got shook up a long time ago and I made up in my mind that God's going to be first to my finances. And if I got to lose a house, lose cars, if I got to lose something material, I'm going to lose that. But I'm going to give God his due. I'm going to put God first. I'm going to keep God first. Because let me tell you something. When you do that, God's got your back, your side, your middle, your top and your bottom. What? I know what I'm talking about. Why? Because I've been there. I've been there where I can truly say God has me fully covered. Give God praise if you understand half of what I'm saying. Yeah, I like this. Is anybody being blessed tonight? Man, y'all are a great audience tonight. Can I go just a little bit deeper? Can I go just a little bit deeper? I'm trying to find a place to close. I got so much I want to share with y'all. I'm going to have to do part two of this. I want to go to 1 Timothy 6 and 10. 1 Timothy, yeah, 6 and 10. When y'all get it, say you got it. I'm going to see if I can pull it up for you. Make it easy for you. I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. I think it may be on another area of my slide. So let me see. Let me see if this is it. Don't y'all laugh now. If this ain't it because I'm, I'm flying blind, but I'm doing everything I can to keep the enemy from having the victory tonight. And I think we're doing pretty good considering everything he's thrown at us. First Timothy 6 and 10. Do y'all have it? Let's see if I can pull it up. Thank you, Lord. Here it is. It says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. Lord, have mercy. Have done what? Wandered from the faith. And they have pierced themselves with many griefs. Folks, you talk about the love of money is a dangerous thing. And let me be clear. Money is amoral. Let's be clear. What does that mean? Money is neither good or bad. And I need you to hear me say that. Money is amoral. It is neither good or bad. Here's what you got to hear me say, though. Our relationship with money determines the kind of evil we'll do to get it, and it determines the kind of evil we will do to keep it. It's our relationship with money. And the Bible clearly warns us, whatever you love in this life, God says, do not love money. Love a dog, love a cat, love a chicken, love a horse. But one thing God said, don't love, don't love money. 
Because if you love money, money going to make you do some evil things to get it. And it's going to make you do some evil things to keep it. God uses money the third way. Are y'all being blessed? I told you God uses money three ways to do three things. Here's the last one. God uses money, number three, to guide you along. God uses money to guide you along. Check out Galatians 6 and 9. Show you how God guides us along using money. It says, let us not become weary in doing good. Yeah. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Yeah, I love that verse. God says, don't be weary doing good. Now, you got to understand something. Here's what God is telling us. God desires for us to do good with money. Money has a purpose. Money is a tool. But if you don't use the tool, the tool will use you. And then you become the tool and money becomes the master. And money is a horrible master. I am trying to tell you. So it's a tool that God says, I want you to use it to do good. Here's what you got to understand, though, from this verse, Galatians 6 and 9. The return is often slow. I know some folks can testify to that. You give, give, give. You help, help, help. You do, do, do. And sometimes you wonder, man, when is God going to break me off? When, when, when am I going to get a harvest? When am I going to get a breakthrough? And listen... I hear you. I've been there. You got to understand. So you got to understand something. That's the way it is. If that were not the way it is, God would have never told us not to be weary and well doing. He says, no, 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 don't get weary because the return is slow. But you got to remember, don't get weary because when we get weary, what do we do? We quit. When we get weary, we whine. When we quit, we make up excuses. God says, listen, don't get weary. I know the return is slow. But you got to remember my word. I promised you, I will reward you. Somebody said, well, when God going to reward me? Look at the scripture. At the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So your harvest is predicated on you not getting weary and you not giving up, even though it may be taking longer than you desire. God says, you just going to have to, here we go. Have faith in me. Woo! You're going to have to have faith in me. And I know you got faith in me when it's been a long time, but you're still doing good things. I know you got faith in me when it's been a long time, but you're still sowing. You're still obeying me. You're still trusting me. You're still supporting my ministry. God says, okay, I know you got faith in me. And for those of you that, that don't like for pastors to talk about money, I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to apologize because if, if nobody teaches us, We'll continue to get taught by the world. We'll continue to get taught by people who simply have the anti spirit of giving flowing through them. No, you can't beat God giving. God is the best investment that you will ever invest in. And for those that struggle hearing a pastor talk about money, we don't talk about it enough. Honestly, there are over 1000 references to money in the Bible. Did you know that? Those of you that are struggling, listening to a pastor talk about money. And I'm not trying to get anything from you tonight, okay? We're not going to put the Give the Fire link up. We're not going to ask you to give anything. We're going to teach you absolutely free tonight because I want you to know that this word is given to you without any strings attached in hopes that you would look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know what? I really do need to do better as it relates to my connection with sowing into the kingdom my connection with having a generous spirit as it relates to things that pertain to God. Over 1,000 references in the Bible. Did you know that money is the second most mentioned subject in the Bible? Did you know that? Money is the second most mentioned subject in the Bible. Do you know what the first subject is that's mentioned in the Bible more than money? The number one subject? It's love. Check this out. Love is number one. Money is number two. This is why, let me bless you, God says you can't love money. You can't get those two intertwined and intertangled because love is number one in the Bible. Money is the second most talked about subject in the Bible. And you got to make sure that you understand how to leverage money and not love money. I'll close with this. 
The way you give is a language that God pays close attention to. Somebody needs to write that down because I am really teaching you tonight. The way you give is a language that God pays close attention to. And it's actually two languages. Notice I didn't say how much you give. Notice I didn't say the amount you give. No, I'm talking about the way you give because I told you it's more than about the money. It's also about the motive. It's also about where your heart is. The languages that you speak when you give, I want to bless you and show you what they are. It's the language of love and the language of trustworthiness. The language of love and the language of trustworthiness are the languages that you speak whenever you give to God. And God pays close attention to those languages because they convey to him how much you love him, why you're giving, what your motives are. Are you cheerful about it? Are you excited about it? Are you giving for the sole purpose of trying to get something from God? Or are you giving as a full expression of how much you love and appreciate God? God listens when we give. When we give, we are talking to God. When we give, we are worshiping God. And I just want to encourage you tonight to ask yourself this final question as I get ready to close. This is a good one, man. Is God pleased with how you express your love and your trustworthiness with the amount of money that you deal with week after week, month after month, day after day, year after year? Is God pleased? That's the question. Now, you have to answer that for yourself. That's not a question I can answer. Do you think God is pleased based on what I've taught you tonight? Do you think God is pleased? I want God to be pleased with you. God wants to be pleased with you. I believe that's why he gave me this lesson tonight. I believe that's why the enemy did everything he could to try to make sure that this did not happen tonight. But guess what, guys? We persevered. We pressed through. God blessed us to make it do what it do. Now, you've heard the word tonight. The question is, how are you going to respond? Are you going to say, you know what? Pastor Troy talked to me tonight. Pastor Troy spoke a word that I need to adhere to and listen to. And I really need to put God first. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything else that we need will be added to us. That seek ye first means to make God a priority in every area of our lives. Not just some Sunday morning activity, but he's a seven day week priority. He's a priority in your relationships. He's a priority in your finances. He's a priority in your career. He's a priority in every area of your life. God says, all I want you to do is put me first because all I've ever done is put you first. Mm. God says, I just want you to love me the way I love you. I just want you to do for me what I do for you. Love me. Put your trust in me. And allow me to show you how I will take care of you. Let's pray. Father God, I want to say thank you tonight. We have victory. <laughs> this live stream was a challenge, but we made it through. And Father, I ask that you would touch our hearts. We invite you to work in every aspect of our life, including our finances. Father, we ask that you would use our finances to number one, teach us to trust you. Number two, use our finances to teach us to become trustworthy. Number three, use our finances and guide us, God, so that we can do good and not get weary. And then number four, use our finances to, to Help us be able to meet needs of fellow believers and even be able to meet needs of unbelievers. God, we want to be right on the money. We don't want to get everything else right and get the money thing wrong. But you talked about love more than anything in the Bible. And right after love, you talked about money. Second, most than anything else. So we know that those two are important to you. We also ask you to forgive us, Father. 
Forgive us if we robbed you. Forgive us if we made excuses. Forgive us if we have allowed the opinions of others to matter more than what your word says. Help us see that this is a heart issue more than anything. Because anything we love, we give to. Anything we love, we support. Anything we love, we sacrifice for. Because love does. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Well, listen, guys, we got to give God praise tonight for the victory. <laughs> Man, I feel really good right now because when I tell you the devil did everything he could to stop this from going on. And we did it only by the grace of God. Thank you, guys. I know you guys were praying and supporting us all the way through. God is awesome and amazing. I honestly believe that God is getting ready to do some amazing things this year. And I think that's why he continues to give us these amazing messages because he wants us to get in position so that he can do the things that he desires to do. Well, guys, this is Pastor Troy Wynn, senior, senior pastor of the Freedom Church. And I just want to tell you, I love you. I'm praying for you. And I want to invite you to join us this Sunday. If you're anywhere near the Warner Robins, Georgia area, we have our in-person Sunday services at 11 a.m. Everyone is asked to wear a mask and masks are provided. Temperature checks are happening at the door before you enter the sanctuary. And I ask you to come join us. Come fellowship with God and come fellowship with your brothers and sisters. 11 a.m. The address is 820 North Houston Road, Warner Robins, Georgia. I would love to see you in the building. Well, that's it for tonight. This is our Wisdom Wednesday experience, and I have been blessed. I pray you've been blessed. Until we meet again, good night. Love you.